Ahí ya te estás uniendo. Eduardo, cuando deseas iniciar. Iniciamos. Ya estamos con 40 participantes. 50. Cuando guste. Muy buenos días. Good morning. At this point, we're going to start the webinar Water Sanitation and Hygiene for Health Establishment and, and the initial uh, uh, protocol for the results and the World Initiative for the Americas for the for the work uh, the national institute and the, the ETRA CDE team of the PAHO organizations would like to search for the access to the access for services of water sanitation and hygiene, watch for, for the health services, considering the, the tools for WASH. The objective of this webinar is to introduce sort of the work that has been uh, done for the evaluate, facilitate the evaluation of this established for Latin American air and hygiene, but also in terms of solid waste, cleaning, energy, uh, and uh, environment in, in taking, taking into account the effects of the climate change. We had invited a distinguished guest, and I'm going to introduce the panel that is joining us. First, we have Daniel um, Buss, who's going to be doing the opening remarks. He is the director of the unit CDC of PAHO in Washington, D.C., and he's a biology with master in ecology and doctorate in public health, and he has a specialty of environmental monitoring, water quality, and the policies of public policies and environmental policies. And also we have Eduardo Ortiz, who is the consultant for ETRAS uh, PAHO uh, in the unit of climate change of uh, health determinants for health, and he is working in Peru. And he's a master in environmental engineers, 32 years of experience in the development of environmental engineers. He has the experience in emergency, in sanitary emergencies for Latin America and in the humanitarian aid. And we also have the participation of Margarita Montgomery. She is the technical officer in three areas, important water, uh, sanitation and hygiene in health centers, and she uh, works in, in the emergencies wash for PAHO. With Geneve, she is an environmental engineer with more than 30 years of experience, and she has a doctorate in, in, in environmental engineering focused in the public health. And we also have Teofilo Montero. He's a civil engineer. He's specialized in public health and sanitation. And he has a doctoral degree in, in Thailand in the United Kingdom and a master's in, in the University of Sao Paulo, Brazil. He works as a consultant in, in um, PAHO and World Health and uh, bringing uh, technical cooperation for Latin American countries. And he's currently associate professor in, uh, in health matters in, in environmental matters. And we also have Patricia Segurado. She is a civil engineer with master's in, in, in environmental engineering. 
and she has directed the regional team for ETRAS for the unit of climate change and uh, the uh, health determinants uh, and for the 2018 and 20. Uh, and she has experience in the development of different uh, age, um, the thematics and in health PCS, uh, which is the water safety plans and the sanitation uh, uh, plans, security plans. And we also have, we're going to start with the introductory uh, words from Daniel Bruss. Thank you, Hilde, Eduardo, all the colleagues. It is an honor and a pleasure to be here in this session because we have our friends uh, the, for a long time, uh, not only from uh, World Health and Mar Margaret Montgomery, but also we have uh, Teofilo Monteiro and uh, uh, Patricia Segurado, who have supported us for so many years in PAHO in water sanitation and hygiene, and continue to support us with these uh, topics. Uh, as an open remarks from the unit of uh, climate change uh, of PAHO, I, the, the, the health in terms of the health centers, it is a fundamental role, not only for water uh, sanitation and hygiene, but also for our support work uh, for the establishment of the health systems. Above all, what we have learned in a very hard way with COVID situation, and that has a that has shown a, a, um, a, 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 an effect in the, the, the environmental determinants. It has an environmental origin, and also all of these processes. These are processes that have been exacerbated or have uh, worsened the effects on diseases because of the, the existing deficiencies. For example, the lack of sustainability in terms of uh, sanitation, efficient sanitation, um, contamination, the chemical contamination, and all the effects of the climate change that are combined. In the central uh, theme and this for this work is to use the implementation of a health uh, agenda that was launched uh, last year by PAFO and that gives us 10 years, uh, the 10 years how to initiate an agenda of work uh, that is linked with the climate change, uh, uh, water sanitation, uh, wastewater management, the quality of air and uh, security, uh, um, safety, uh, chemical safety, etc. This is a lot of in the agenda and I'm very, very happy and excited to have Teofilo, Patricia and so many colleagues of so many years in this session and I hope that we can move forward with the uh, um, instructions and we have, we're going to be pending what comes out of this seminar. So thank you, Eduardo Hilde, and I'm going to give the mic for the, uh, for the rest of the people. Now we're going to have the presentation of the initiative of World Health Organization for Health. And uh, Margaret Montgomery uh, gave us a video and I'm, we're going to show the video at this moment. No hay audio, disculpa, Joana. Joana, disculpa, no, no se escucha audio. el audio. Sí. Tienes que compartir el audio con okay, el sistema. Segundo. Listo, me confirma. And the update on the new tools concerning. Sí, yo. Sí. Queremos comentarle que tenemos traducción simultánea, así que por favor, que escuchar en español. We have simultaneous translations, so you can hear it in Spanish. We will bring this presentation to you today about the global situation and the update on the new tools concerning WASH and healthcare facilities. I'm very sorry I can't join you virtually, nor be in the room with you, but 
I trust your deliberations will be fruitful and that you will come away with new energy and new vision for what needs to be done to improve wash and healthcare facilities in your country and in your region. So I'm going to share my slides now and hopefully you will get a copy of them as well. So we know access to wash in healthcare facilities globally is incredibly low and poor. The latest data, um, which was released in 2020, found that one in four healthcare facilities lacked basic water. Now, basic water isn't even our minimum guidelines or standards. It's just having a, a source of water on site. This is exposing 1.8 billion people to a greater risk of infection every year. So rather than going to a healthcare facility to get healed, people are getting sick. Similar gaps exist in terms of hand hygiene. One in three lack good hand hygiene facilities. One in three also do not segregate waste safely. And one in 10 have no toilets or anywhere to use a bathroom. The new data that the WHO UNICEF Joint Monitoring Program has been busy collating and extracting from nationally representative surveys will be coming out very soon, actually next week. So I encourage you to go visit the washdata.org to find out the latest situation in your country. In the least developed countries, the gaps are even greater. So we have half of facilities not having any water. Now this photo at the bottom shows a birthing room in West Africa, and you can just imagine how difficult it must be for the midwives and the doctors, as well as for mothers to, to deliver babies in such situation. On the right, you see, however, that with a little bit of investment and thinking, you can put in toilets, for example, that are accessible to those um, with limited mo mobility, that are gender segregated, and that are clean and functional. So what is the world doing about the situation? Um, well, in 2019, we had, for the first time ever, memberships Member states commit to improving wash and healthcare facilities through a World Health Assembly resolution. Now, the resolution very clearly calls on member states to develop national roadmaps, to strengthen standards, to make sure that wash and IPC are integrated into health program and monitoring. And in particular, to look at inequities, we see that in particular in maternity settings or in primary care settings, which are largely fre frequented by mothers and children, wash services um, are even less than in the normal, um, for example, outpatient area. The resolution also calls on the WHO Director General to provide leadership, technical guidance, and regular report on the status of wash and healthcare facilities. There's obviously also a need for governments to improve domestic and increase domestic financing, as well as to mobilize partners and investments. So what, what is the status? What have countries done since this resolution? Well, WHO and UNICEF are tracking countries' actions, which are clearly articulated in the resolution and also further elaborated in the eight practical steps, which are national actions we know that will uh, further improve not only services, but the sustainability of those services over time. So we currently have data on 65 countries, nine countries from the Pajo region, and I know there's more out there than nine that are making progress. So really encourage you um, to submit your data and you can see the link there where you can um, share whatever standards or progress you've made. Um, green is is a representative of that the action has been completed. So. Um, here, if you look at Bolivia, they have green on situational analysis, um, whereas yellow or orange are somewhere in between. They've started but haven't finished, and red um, is the step hasn't really been started. So what what's what's happening in Paha? Well, this um, shows Bolivia, Brazil, Colombia, Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua, Panama, Paraguay and Peru. So these are the countries that we have data on. Um, and you can see there's a bit of variability. There's been quite a bit of progress. The blue, the first blue line is situational analysis. So four is meant to represent that green color. That's those have been completed. And, you know, the, the purpose of those situational analysis is to really set a strong foundation for not only bringing together the multi-sectorial partners from WASH and health, 
um, and financing, but also to make sure that um, major gaps, whether it's on the policy side or the programmatic side, are addressed. Much less progress has been made on integration, and for integration, we um, are looking at whether or not WASH indicators are included in the regular health systems management information systems. So you can see no country in, in the region has fully integrated that, and we would see that as is quite important in order to make sure that health systems colleagues, um, the financing and that those regular policy reviews are taking a close look at the WASH situation. We are actively, and I say we, WHO and UNICEF, looking for updated data because in 2023 we will have um, the next um, and the last in, in the current um, uh, uh, format of the Global Progress Report um, as required for the World Health Assembly resolution. So 2023 is the last report back. So what are these practical steps? Well, as I mentioned, they're proven national actions and they're everything from conducting a situational analysis to setting targets, defining a roadmap, um, establishing national standards, improving infrastructure, monitoring and reviewing data, developing the health workforce, engaging communities and conducting operational research and learning. Uh, you can read more about these steps, both in our 2019 report, where we first presented them, as well as in the 2020 report. We do have more detailed guidance for a number of the steps, and I just wanted to highlight the first one, conduct a situational analysis and assessment. In 2020, WHO and UNICEF published not only the guide to understanding barriers to quality of care, and this has all kinds of um, tools and signposts on in terms of how you would do a policy review or a key informant interv uh, interview, how would you engage these actors? And it also gives um, some examples of where this was implemented in Ethiopia, Ghana, and Rwanda. And the findings were really interesting because each country has approached WASH and healthcare facilities slightly different. In um, Ghana, it, it really is under a much bigger umbrella um, of, of around quality, whereas in Ethiopia, it really started from an infrastructure point of view and then morphed um, more into an IPC um, quality element. And in Rwanda, it's very much grounded around their community health systems and community health workers. So each one gives a little bit of a different nuance. What's interesting, all countries found, for example, the importance of engaging the users. So getting feedback on those WASH services, understanding differences in design, in particular um, for women, um, which may have particular needs around menstruation or after giving childbirth. For the other steps, two through eight, also equally important, um, there's all kinds of examples on our on our global knowledge portal. So you can look at national strategies, you can look up national standards. Um, if you want to find more about Wash Fit, and I'll talk about that in a minute because we've just released a new updated, expanded package. Um, or if you're just trying to understand, okay, what are the key indicators? That's all up there. So really encourage you to go to our resource site um, and really think about if you haven't progressed on these steps, what needs to be done and what resources might be there. Just very quickly as a slight aside, but related to this work is our work on healthcare waste, which is part of the much bigger WASH umbrella. WHO did an analysis, which we launched um, earlier this year, that looked at what was happening with the COVID waste. And, you know, we were getting reports from facilities and further review found that the volumes had increased quite a bit. And, and on average, it was three to four times. And where there was no waste segregation, it was 10 times. So this is enormous, um, in particular, considering that many facilities were already struggling to handle their healthcare waste. When looking at the data from the UN um, COVID-19 supply portal, we found some really interesting trends. One was that there were many more gloves shipped than masks, even though for many of the COVID interactions, for example, you know, whether it was testing or vaccination, gloves weren't necessarily recommended. What was recommended was to clean your hands with either alcohol-based hand rub or soap and water. Um, and this is indicative of the fact that nearly half of the PPE that was sent, which we can assume all of it will eventually become waste, was non-essential. So this could have been avoided. So not only were there massive 
environmental repercussions from all this non-essential PPE, but there was also many cost implications, right? Like those funds could have been spent on improving and sustaining better services. So what were some of the recommendations? The number one was recommendation was we have to change how we procure and what we procure. Only procure what is needed and to take a really careful look at practices in particular around PPE. Um, Bio-based packaging and less packaging and you know these these this idea that masks, for example, need to be in, in, in single sealed packages um, in many cases um, is not necessary. Also, we found that it's really important to have strong national sustainable waste policies and regulations. And then if there's a strong call and enforcement at the national level, it's much easier for the healthcare facilities to figure out how to procure in a green way to push back against procurement that's not needed. We obviously need to increase investments in training and waste workers and their expertise, in particular with the push and the incremental change to switch from burn to non-burn waste treatment technologies. Um, again, it, it's important to think about how we're situating and managing those treatment technologies. And for some of the smallest facilities, it's really hard um, to, to, to manage a, a, a waste treatment technology, nor does it make sense because the volumes are so small. Rather, what we've seen and increasingly finding more examples that waste can be sent back through reverse logistics chains. So the supply trucks that come to facilities and bring vaccines and other commodities and often go back empty could be going back with waste that could be then treated at a larger facility where they have the personnel and the technology. And I think lastly, it, it, there was a point that we all need to be cautious consumers and, and procure only what we need and to seek reusable, more environmentally friendly options um, where they exist. Okay, so this is all great, but what is a cost and how are we gonna pay for it? Well, earlier this year, um, and you can see the link down below, we published um, the cost of, of making sure that all healthcare facilities have basic wash services in the least developed countries and found that this would lead to a 6.5 to 9.6 billion dollar price tag which is equal to about 60 cents per person per year so when you look at it at a per capita basis it's quite a reasonable cost and even compared to government spending on health in the least developed countries it's only three percent of the spending so the costs are fairly modest and the returns in terms of quality of care in terms of uptake of services in terms of infections prevented and this prevention of AMR spread are all quite high. The biggest costs are for non-hospitals and waste management. And this is because there's so many more of, of those non-hospitals, those smaller primary care and clinics that are in need. Um, and on the waste side, it, it really is because to invest in that initial treatment technology can be quite expensive, which is all the more reason to make sure we're reducing as much as possible the volumes of waste being produced. Okay, so we know what needs to happen. We know the costs are fairly reasonable. What, where do we actually start? What, what needs to happen at the facility level? Well, this is where WashFit comes in and WashFit is based upon water safety planning and sanitation safety planning. And it's really um, a, a tool to assess and prioritize and make incremental risk-based improvements. Um, the new package, which we just launched in April, has a much bigger focus and streamlined throughout on climate, um, as well as on gender and equity. So we found that these are two areas that increasingly we were getting requests um, to respond to. It also looks much more at the prevention of the spread of pathogens. So we talk more about the safe management of fecal waste not just dumping it in a latrine or a toilet and forgetting about it. We talk about um, uh, the spread of waterborne pathogens such as Legionella and some areas that are much more applicable to more advanced facility settings like I know are in many of your cities um, and countries. So just to give an example on, on climate resilience and water in particular, many regions Sadly, this year have been seeing incredible droughts that have gone on now for many years. Simple things like raising the water storage tank. So when the rain does finally come, the, the, the tanks won't be damaged by flooding, but also 
we'll be using less energy um, once we need to use the water in those storage tanks um, to pump through the system. Rainwater harvesting, where that's possible, and we found in many places that water is fairly um, clean and, and just requires some simple disinfection before distribution, but also making sure that there's backup water supplies as well as energy supplies um, in the case of power outages or, or major drought. Lots of simple water reduction strategies, which I'm sure many of you have already dealt with around fixing leaking taps, turning off the water and scrubbing hands, reducing gray water. But to really make these meaningful, they need to be systematically implemented and addressed. And that's where the wash fit tool um, comes in really, really handy. One other thing I just wanted to emphasize is, is we have more guidance on water treatment and, and WHO at the point of use has now tested 50 products. So there's lots of examples of what could be implemented um, at the point of use if the water coming from the municipal plant is not safe. Um, but also the need to prioritize water for drinking. Being hydrated is incredibly important for, for healing and for those in the hospitals, as well as um, for the workers, many of which are, are working under quite a bit of stress. Um, as well as for cleaning and other essential services. So this is an example of a technical fact sheet. We have other fact sheets on gender, on climate, on healthcare waste, and coming soon on um, cleaning, um, as well as on hand hygiene. So here's a list of all the resources. Again, you can go to the knowledge portal, washinhcf.org, and if you go to the Wash Fit site, you'll find all these resources. At the moment, most are in English, but they're all under translation into all the UN official languages. So in particular for PAHO, um, Spanish and French will be coming out um, later this year. So I'm gonna end there. I just wanna remind you all that you're health leaders. And as we've seen in this pandemic, health leaders aren't just leaders for health, they're leaders for the entire community. So your voice and your action matters. I really encourage you to learn and engage, understand the status of water and sanitation, of infection prevention control, of waste in your country and your facility, and reach out to other health and WASH actors to understand how you can best engage in collective efforts. There's lots of ways you can connect globally through Twitter or if you're on social media, through our um, knowledge portal, but also encourage you to connect um, at the local level. And then finally, make commitments to act. In the last global, global progress report, we recommended four main recommendations, and those recommendations still stand today about implementing targeted plans with dedicated budgets, about monitoring and reviewing progress, about integrating water and sanitation hygiene into health care sector planning and budgeting and to developing the capacity of the health workforce. So it's been a real honor to get to um, give this presentation today and I really look forward to hearing about your discussions and the outcomes and working together with you as you try to advance this really important issue in the Americas. So have a wonderful rest of the meeting and I hope to hear from you soon. Bye bye. Agradecemos a Maggie for the video. Ahora... Thank Maggie for the video. And now we're going to have the presentation of Eduardo Ortiz, who's going to introduce you uh, to water and sanitation in with regard to uh, climate. I'm very happy to hear the Geneve uh, colleagues with the challenges that they are facing right now. I'm going to talk a little slower for the translation. I'm going to present the protocol for the uh, assessment of the health facilities that we had for the Americas. The methodology that you had many stages and the methodology had several stages and the determination, the determination of the sample, of, uh, the institutional coordination, the, samples, the, the uh, training for the surveyors uh, or the interviewers and the collecting of the information, the processing of the information, the analysis of the information. When we're talking about this, we're saying that uh, recently ETRAS uh, and, and uh, the organization uh, they made a study of the countries 
that was Guatemala, Honduras, Paraguay, Peru, and Mexico. And they had a sample of 1,697 health facilities, 608 for the second and 244 uh, tertiary level with a total of 6,922. We registered information of 110 variables on the characteristics for wash services solid waste drainage and vector control and we had a coefficient of uh, reliability of 95 percent heterogeneity of 25 percent and a sample error of five percent to begin with this is the decision making process what i would call a classic to work with the health center and to define access to information that we're going to have for the entire protocol as it is understood and how we train at the central level. This is work that we do and we leave the methodology open to the country to use it as they wish. And we determine the sample. This is something classical. You may remember that at some point in time, we had to manage standard deviation, which is the traditional statistical definition where we do the size of the sample where we're going to develop these. We also defined a reliability coefficient or a confidence uh, factor for this survey. And we did a heterogeneity that was from 0.2 to 0.3 in the study protocol, which was 0.25, which was the ideal for this type of work. And the universe took all health establishments that correspond to the National Health Network. This is going to indicate, or it comes from a country, that we have the health services. And this, in our particular case, was going to the uh, extreme health services. Now, the sample is a protocol of 5% for this, and we have more or less than 50. Now, the health facilities chosen, we did a list of all the facilities the department to do this type of work. And we had sanitary inspectors to work with the instrument. And we worked with the health services that are under the authorities. Sometimes it's the vice ministry, health services, or the general health director, depending on the country. And we did all this locally. And in the Department of State to the unit itself to have all this information and make sure that everybody knew that we were going to be working with this uh, unit survey. We took the samples with a minimum of basic knowledge for the staff for each module that was trained. And we did the different workshops with the health staff to have a health registry of the different forms. So we raised the information and the survey had several levels. And the solid residue waste, hospital cleaning, the other areas in uh, to continue to work and uh, the different work uh, working staff and we had a protocol with the indications and the questions that needed to be completed with the different cl um, information paragraphs we also took samples in water quality etc we worked on using the information in each health facility that completed the surveys. And we verified that all the questions would be answered 
in their entirety, make sure that there's no discrepancies. This is incredibly important in order to maintain the quality of the data. And in the long run, we had a all the information, we drafted the charts, we tabulated, and it's all now in a database that is available in our organization. Uh, the webinar is not for the methodology, it's just an overview of how we did the survey. So I think that the most interesting thing here is going to be the results that our colleagues will present following. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eduardo. So Eduardo already presented the protocol for the assessment of all these water hygiene and health hygiene services and now Dr. Monteiro will give us the results obtained in this uh, seven country study. Dr. Teofilo, the floor is yours. Hola, muchas gracias. De hecho, Hi, thank you very much. As a matter of fact, I'm going to share my screen if you will so give me that permission and allow me to. Bueno, ahí está. Bueno, thank you. There it is. Okay. So first of all, to thank uh, Pajo for the invitation, for allowing me here to present the results of this survey in the seven countries. And uh, for those colleagues that are working here, there are a lot of uh, familiar names, many colleagues that we're working with, partners that we've been working with for years. And now I'm in the University of Rio de Janeiro, working with uh, the university and I have some is, uh, is something hiding my presentation? I, I don't know if you can see my screen. If you put it in presentation mode, you can see it quite well. If we can put it in presentation mode, that would be great. Okay, this is perfect. Okay, so based on the presentation, so this introduction is presented as a motivation to do this work that PAHO and the World Health Organization and working with UNICEF and the other countries and to think that it's important that each facility. Sorry, Dr. Teofilo, I apologize. We cannot see your presentation. We continue to see. So please click on the little slide that says introduction. But it's not there. No, 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 And if you put it on presentation mode, Teofilo, to help you out. Ahora. Ahora bien. Muy bien. Bueno. Okay, 
So what motivated the countries to work on this topic together with UNICEF for the need that each establishment in health and it's a guarantee and to have the quality and that's why it was necessary to work with water hygiene and health and that we, we could promote initiatives in order to work on that situation in the facilities so the topics of water and hygiene in health facilities is a topic that impacts sustainable development. Now we know the goals uh, for 6162 for water or for wash in general are uh, what they have in the homes with the objective of making this universal and the schools, work facilities, everywhere. It's important to be able to move forward with the uh, health facilities. And it's also very important to work with the 3.8 objectives of the Millennium, De Millennium Development Goals and we cannot think and have a health care service and that wash is inadequate. And you can't work with them at the health facilities in this way. And it's also to uh, understand that this is important to decrease the number of deaths and diseases produced by chemical products, water pollution, uh, well, air, water, and soil pollution. So this study took place, as Eduardo said, in seven countries as of 2016 with a protocol that was prepared by an NGO that supported us and then applying the protocol in the different countries with the support of AIDI's cooperation. So we worked in seven countries. We had 1,697 health facilities that were presented by Eduardo. So we have a link at the bottom of this slide where we can find the information. And it's a really nice report in the different countries. So the result of these countries We have a presentation for each component in each health facility. So on average, we studied 82.7% to supply uh, water to the health facilities, but that number varies from the primary, secondary, and tertiary levels the more complicated are the tertiary and it's 90 percent more or less of access to water services directly in the public network going down to 75.8 percent when they're primary and when we talk about maintenance it's also important only 35 percent have maintenance for their water systems or adequate water maintenance systems and that has to do with the capacity for the investment and this is a variable investment from one to another in in the primary and the secondary and the tertiary we have 56 percent so when we think about continuing uh, continuity of services we have only 79.2 percent they don't have it 24 hours and this obligates the staff to conserve water or to save water because there is none. And so that influences the quality of the water that is being supplied. 
and that is made available for these facilities. So that goes between 72 and 84 percent. And the primary services are the ones that are most affected in access. Now, regarding quality, and to consider the quality, we can no longer consider the monitoring program that was mentioned that monitors this uh, global system and we recommend here the quality that has fecal contamination and that's one of the main issues but on occasion we had to analyze what we have to consider the different aspects of uh, ecobiological contamination on the quality of biologicals. Now, hygiene, and that number we can see here, only 57.8% in the public network, in the drain systems from the tertiary levels. When we see 15.8% is a, using a simplified sanitation system located on site. When we have access, we have 63% of bathrooms for patients. It's access to bathrooms separated by sex, and for the staff is 61.5%. So when we see here, there are still 34% of health services. Can you imagine one bathroom for the entire facility, and uh, this is even a bigger issue or more complex in tertiary, and some of them only have a single bathroom. And here we have a restricted mobility, 33.4% that have uh, restricted mobility in bathrooms. and. We have uh, hygiene, and this continues to be delayed in the water. And we have to have a greater investment. And something more important when we are speaking about hygiene. We had access to sinks, uh, soap, and we have um, sinks with soap, and sinks are 40% without soap. So we see other strategic uh, situations, and we, this is interesting data. So 80.9%, which is a pretty high number, and here we have a strategy for training people to wash their hands, so people are interested and to know the importance of uh, hand washing and the infrastructure. And they have knowledge that we're going to have that training. And there is a huge infrastructure. So when we have solid waste, 83% 
have the classification of the waste and the characteristics of the primary care levels. And when we talk about cleaning and internal collection, we have 71 or 72 percent of the staff or the internal staff themselves do the cleaning and collecting waste. We have 58 percent in tertiary level, 65 in secondary, and 80 in primary. When we think about our external collection and transport of waste, this is going to be the establishment of 5% for tertiary levels, 21 for primary, and 33% only have some kind of a final storage place for infectious waste. They have their own mechanism prepared for disinfection of that material. And that's 83% at the tertiary level and 46.9% at the primary. What's in? And the hospital infections. And what is the collection, the most adequate collection? And specifically what we have internally and the importance given and the infection and how they work on the collection of this, but definitely it's going to help a lot in the primary care levels. And regarding drainage, and we have this variability as well, and we're going to have 83% that would be directly with, of which the drainage systems are considered operational, and that would be 63%, and there wouldn't be a need of their own investments that are taking place. And so we're talking about drainage systems, 30% varying here, a rainwater drainage as well as sewer water systems. And we have 15% at the primary, up to 46% at the tertiary level. When we have a uh, place for rainwater to go, it's a problem as 34% continues to do that practice of having rainwater into the public um, ways. And it's only uh, when we talk about open water sewers, we have the numbers on the upper right. So when we're talking about vector issues in the different health facilities, we have 92.5 have issues with vectors and fauna. It varies from 94.7 to 94.9. These numbers are extremely high with the problems present. They have different foci. When we're talking about control, and this is an issue only 52% uh, vector control of uh, the different levels. When we have a program for vector control, Health facility, on average, varying from 64.2 percent. Our variations are from 53 to 79 percent. 
and 40% of the facilities have rodents. And that's a pretty high number, considering that these are health facilities and how we're going to have the health facilities. It goes from 34.8% at the tertiary level to 53.3% at the primary level. And so, so all of this is a situation that as the homes have shown this scale, it's important to have a basic level. We're talking about 24, 25, we're gonna have 80% of the facilities with a basic level and this is access to water, but water still of uh, hygiene. There's still a lot to be done in all of these facilities. Water, get it from an improved source located in the facilities. This is something that we need to, or we would hope to expect at least 80% of the facilities from 2025 to 2030 to make it universal. Now each country can define as we have for uh, water. Resupply systems, this is something that we can do, but we have to work on water and everything else. It's difficult to define, but we do have to reach at least 80% in 2025. And it's uh, less than three years away. So uh, 2030 is also pretty close. So it's all these scales that we have at least a basic service in almost 78.3% for 2025, almost 80%. Here we have 13, 8.7. So we have to move these this way and to reach uh, those percentages. Sanitation, we have 51.7% and we have to reach that 80% and uh, there's a lot to work on here. So all these uh, hygiene scales, 49.8%. Uh, here we also have some more that need to uh, play a little more catch up or a lot harder catch up. And in the solid waste, we have 67.5%. There's a lot to work on in one and two. So, the conclusion is that 17.3% of the facilities, of the healthcare facilities, lack water services in the public network, supplying themselves from wells, cistern trucks. A surfing issue is water quality because only 54% have the, or comply with the residual chlorine levels according to the guidelines of their own countries. And for the Sustainable Development Goals, the monitoring program recommends an absence of fecal contamination and chemical levels of significance that are within the most important limits. And this quality indicator that we're using with chlorine levels it would be easier to use, but it's important to say that we still have to move to know the level of fecal contamination that we have in these facilities. 12% of these facilities do not have operational sanitation services for patients. And regarding hygiene, 40% of the facilities do not have operational sinks with soap, which puts at risk the health of patients and the staff. 
And that's a situation that we live tragically. And so you can imagine that a health facility doesn't have the minimum prevention that we need to have, uh, even or despite the pandemic. So this it makes it even worse. And that's, I think, uh, what caused a lot of cases and deaths during the pandemic. And 15% of the health facilities do not treat their solid waste, of which 68% of these wastes are put, of, is put in places that are unsafe, like dumps. They're burnt up in the open skies. There's many situations where the health facilities have a serious issue. More than 20 years later, we're looking to get rid of these open dump sites. And this is a big issue in all of our countries. And only 63.6% Six percent of the health facilities have operational rainwater drainage, and this is a risk that is considered that 34.7 percent is dumped into the streets, open spaces, causing flooding and uh, puddles. 92.5 percent of the facilities has a vector issue, among them mosquitoes, flies, roaches, and there's a need to implement efficient control for the eradication of said vectors. The monitoring indicators, uh, together with uh, hygiene, sanitation and hygiene, are below the target of 80% for basic services that to be complied with in 2025 or to be reached in 2025. The first level of care required for greater attention is due to the present values below in the indicator that are lowest in the indicator. So what do we need to do? We already know the situation. And there's a great number of countries. And we're going to establish national routes, budgets, funding. And theoretically, in general, we have to see where the countries are, how the region is doing, and uh, essentially that environment of the health facilities develop the capacities always and maintain the wash services and promote good hygiene practices, integrate the wash services in planning, budgeting, and regular programming in the health sector, including activities. Uh, it's a work that all of us have to do, not only the municipality. We have to work on these. It has to be together. And we have to do this with the health sector. And it's an investment that has to be made so we can move forward. If it's uh, segregated, we cannot move forward. Oh, that's what I had to present for today. So thank you very much for your attention. And I think that my presentation is going to be shared with the participants. So you can uh, read the information that is there. Thank you very much, Dr. Monteiro. We have an announcement. The first one is that the presentation is going to be sent to everyone who participated in this webinar. We would also like to tell you that the study as well and the questions that are made based on time, we want you to send them to this email that we're putting into the chat at the moment. And finally, we have technical comments from Patricia Segurado, who is going to talk about what she thinks about what has been said up to now. So, Patricia, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Silvia. I'm going to put the presentation up. It's very brief. So, first of all, uh, can you see it? Yes, your screen is visible. Thank you. Okay, so first of all, 
thanks to everyone for inviting me to this presentation. I think that we have seen or you've given us a good scenario of uh, sanitation, hygiene, and water in health facilities, uh, critical information, and it's important for decision-making, but why? Well, in the first instance, we collected and gathered all the information for seven countries that gives us a photograph of what is happening at the moment, and it tells us what we need to move forward with and according to levels of care. We see the critical points but this protocol is also available where it's aligned with the proponents of what Maggie presented in the initial presentation, where we have all the climate components, uh, hygiene in hospitals, and we have all the basic indicators, so to speak, and the countries can identify if they have the basic indicators or not and move toward other indicators that would allow a better scenario what's happening in the country. Okay, so why is this information important? Well, it's not having information just to have information. It's to uh, cause action. The resolution that we have WA 72-7 for water, hygiene, etc. that the countries had and that was unanimous, the WHA 72.7, is where we gathered the initial information of what was happening in WASH in general. And in this resolution, and the countries were uh, committed to have comprehensive changes. The diagnostic is in the resolution, uh, the need to know what's going on in the countries. Seven countries is too little for the region because we're running blind. If we don't have information, we cannot move forward toward an adequate or toward the right goals. So we have to find roadmaps and we have to know where we're investing. If it's the care level, primary, secondary, tertiary, and based on what Dr. Teofilo presented, the care levels are the most critical for these. And we have this resolution. And having this resolution implies that the countries need to create public policies that would establish technical guidelines. And sometimes we don't know how many beds the facilities have. But systematically, we don't know what the situation is for water and hygiene. If it's within the bases, and uh, have this for the monitoring and also to have comprehensive uh, programs. We cannot have a program on one side talking about prevention and hygiene, water. And here what we can see is hygiene. And we're working on not on having services that would be safe. And also, we can align to the MDGs. In the first couple of years, when we started the joint process of the MDGs, we only did monitoring toward homes. Today, monitoring includes the healthcare facilities and schools. Why is it important? And the importance lies in, uh, well, because of the COVID issue. So what are these safe spaces where we're able to recover our health and not get sick and uh, get something else? Uh, it's a multi-sectoral coordination mentioned by Teofilo. It's important not only for the healthcare sector, but it's inside the healthcare sector and outside of the healthcare sector, this coordination and the importance that highlights this resolution toward healthcare workers' health. And so we can see critical points. We're also thinking about in 2018, we launched the Astana Declaration where we're talking about primary care as a priority for the countries 
And we see the deficiency that they have in this primary care level. 25% of the services in the health care do not have access. And although it's true that we are unloading all of this into the drainage system, where is that water going? Where is that uh, wastewater going? Is it being treated? Is it not being treated? Where does hygiene play a role in the pandemic? We found a lot of communities that didn't have access to water to even wash their hands. So where is that primary care level close to the communities? in the same condition so there has to be more comprehensive work in that sense patience is also important the pandemic itself uh, the community is also critical and we have to use the information to define areas critical care points for work and it's important for monitoring as well this assessment that we're going to do that Teofilo mentioned for 2025 and how we've made progress in this resolution and the MDGs as well. But how can we give information if we don't have information from the countries to give a quick way? And what we propose is that we can work with the protocol with the rest of the countries for the publication. You can take that information and obtain the basis for the countries of what is going on, add them and have public policies and investment. If we don't have the situations, it's difficult to have public policies and good actions that can take place. And so we have these indicators, we have the basic indicators, but we have water, hygiene, residues, uh, waste, hospitals, uh, as one of the critical points and something that we can continue to develop. In the short term, we do require comprehensive work with the different alliances, et cetera. We cannot work uh, individually. This entire protocol was checked and reviewed on quality care, antimicrobials. It has to be work that is done from the point of view of healthcare services, environmental services, prevention, resistance, and all the sectors that we see involved that work on in the field that can have a significant contribution toward these and have modifications of a state of a situation of the countries. The discussion of the protocol and the routes on the roadmaps are going to be precise. And with this information, we're going to have clear roadmaps toward where our country is headed and where we should make better investments. And we're talking about the wash feed and another tool that is available in the PAHO website that is going to give us how to work at the level of our facilities, not only see the information, but also the public policies and the actions that we can have at the level of my own facility. So these tools have been validated in the wash feed in Peru. And uh, it's also available well, and I think the information for wash fit is clear and the countries need to have this as a priority. And those that have been developed to take advantage of the fact that we have them available. And we're going to use these tools and that includes climate, climate change, the entire topic that has to do with energy. Those are also there. We have all these tools aligned from the training program. I think that we have a lot of work to develop those roadmaps and to have precise information and to sum the information, at least at the basic indicators, be part of the countries. And so we have information of what is going on in the homes and we can have information of what is going on in our facilities, especially healthcare facilities. And in the next emergencies or pandemics that may uh, threaten us, we would be better prepared. So thanks to everyone for allowing me to participate in this event. 
and to share a little bit about the experience that I have and the countries that I've lived in. So thank you very much to Eduardo, Hilde, and Daniel for remembering us. Thank you very much. Warm greetings. Thank you, Alicia. Uh, pertinent comments. Now I'm going to give the final comments to Eduardo Ortiz. Eduardo, you have the floor. Thank you, Hilde. So I think that the information presented is a great challenge, especially for healthcare services and their healthcare to be able to close these or solve these gaps because they're a clear determinant for a better capacity for resolution and to give better care to the community. And it also allows us that healthcare services are not outside of the reality of the community where they're established, as there is a deficit in treating water waste in healthcare services. Obviously, the communities have the same issues. And this makes us think a little bit about different approaches. For example, recently we were discussing being able to attack the initiative of decreasing. Um, open air, uh, but there's a huge number, millions of people that are uh, using drains uh, in open uh, drains, and it was transported in open drains. So all they did was move it from point A to point B. It wasn't treated. There was nothing done. So covering this is something that in the long run is something that we have to visualize as a cooperation. I am very satisfied with the webinar. I would like to thank the colleagues, Teofilo, Patricia Asegurado, Joanna, everyone for And we're going to be announcing the other activities. And for all the colleagues that are participating, we had more than 90 people participating. Definitely, we will be sending the information. Thank you very much to all for the results presented and the ideas given to us. And we can see that more than 30% of the health care facilities are still limited in their services or don't have water services. Close to 50% have limited services or no sanitation services. And the presence of vectors, fauna, all these subjects that were treated, it's evidence that there's a lot of work to be done, like everybody on the panel has said. So we're going to continue presenting tools. Soon we'll have uh, tools for courses, water security, wash fit that is associated to the healthcare facilities, wash spread. And we're going to be inviting each and every one of you for our next sessions. As I was saying, the questions will be answered on the email that was put in the chat and the information will be sent to you via email. So please uh, don't forget to contact us if you have any questions, comments or concerns. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and have a great day.